Okay, we're going to... Um, Yunlin, can we boost this up a little bit? We're going to request Dharma, and you'll want this. Just, just a tad. Ah, that's great. Thank you. Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhassa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahuri Samyao Sanputoshi Namo Sadanto Suchedo Ye Olahuri Samyao Sanputoshi Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zao Yu Wo Jin Jen Wan De Shou Chi Yuan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a million eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture tonight. This is the 25th of November. We're into Sagittarius and we're going to be explaining the Ten Grounds chapter, we're on the eighth stage of the Ten Stages chapter, and let's begin tonight by chanting the name of 
the assembly that brings us the sutra, the sages, the Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, spiritual Dharma protectors, and it's there on the front cover. Namo Ta Fang Guang Fo Hua Yen Ji Ying Hua Yen Hai Hui Po Pu Sa Namo Ta Fang Guang Fo Hua Yen Ji Ying Hua Yen Hai Hui Po Pu Sa Namo Ta-fang-guang-fo-hua-yen-ji-ying-hua-yen-hai-hui-fo-pu-sa-na Ta-fang-guang-fo-hua-yen-ji-ying-hua-yen-hai-hui-po-pu-sa-na Ta-fang-guang-fo-hua-yen-ji-ying-hua-yen-hai-hui-po-pu-sa-na-mo We're here tonight in the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, downtown Berkeley, California, and uh, we've been reciting the Buddha's name for two days, and there's a third day to come, so we have our, our rebirth plaques and our long life plaques, and we've got our uh, big shoes uh, here all day chanting with everybody in a full house of lay people reciting the Buddha's name, and uh, <coughs> we're also pleased that Bhikshu Jinwei has returned from Europe as a new landed immigrant here in America. Good to see him. Last time we saw him was in uh, Krakow, Poland. Uh, a couple, what are you laughing at, Kai? A couple weeks ago, and uh, more than a couple, but he's now uh, officially in the door uh, as a uh, new immigrant, and uh, America has another Bhikshu, and so does Europe. I guess the Dharma realm has another big shoe, so that's good news. Um, so what we're doing is uh, going through the Ten Grounds chapter, the Ten Stages chapter, and we're, uh, we go line by line, passage by passage, and steadily make our way along. We go slow, but we go long, and uh, we've got, uh, we're almost uh, to the end of our sutra, of our Eighth Ground as it describes the path of the bodhisattva at this particular level of wisdom and compassion. So, if you would all turn to page 22 and 23. We're going to, uh, we'll finish up at 9 o'clock tonight. Um, I have something special for reciting Amitabha, which is two particular Amitabha songs from the former Bhikshuni Hungyin's book called Songs for Awakening. One of them is by her, one of them is by me. And uh, I realized that we hadn't actually spent much time uh, digging out these old Amitabha praises, which are pretty good, uh, if I do say so. And tonight we'll, we'll introduce them tonight. The, mine is a three-part round. And uh, you can't do a round straight off. You have to introduce it. And people have to learn it before you can do it to get the three parts working, right? People like rounds, lun chang in Chinese. You, you start one and you start another and you start a third and 
then it's like a, a well-oiled machine that works together with the three parts. So I'll introduce the three parts, and maybe if we... Uh, we haven't had, haven't had a lot of success in the past with rounds. We, we need a strong singer on the other side. But uh, we'll see. That's, it's called the Amitabha song. And then uh, the uh, Bhikshuni Hung Yun's Lonnie Bauer's song is called The Ballad of Amitabha, which uh, maybe you've heard. It's on the song, the uh, Shenzong song, the album that she recorded. She recorded two CDs. It's actually, is it an EP? I don't know if it's a full CD. But it's, uh, it's a really happy Amitabha song. And um, so we'll, we'll do that. Okay, we are on the second paragraph of page 22. Yo, chi, yu, jie, right there. And on page 23, it's also he knows the desire realm. Okay, everybody ready? We'll, uh, I'll give you a line and you give it back. Yo, zhi, yu, jie. Sujian 德汝士官德汝士官三界吃别智 Okay, good job with the Mandarin there. Let's do it together in unison. Ready? Page 23, second paragraph. Here we go. Also, he knows how the desire realm, how the form realm, and how the formless realm are created. Pause. He knows how the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm are destroyed. Pause. Also, he knows the lesser characteristics of the desire realm. We need an of there, that's a typo. The form realm and the formless realm and its greater characteristics, comma. <coughs> I'm sorry. Oh, if you cough, you can't keep the rhythm. Here we go. Starting with its its unlimited characteristics as well as its varied characteristics. Pause. He gains this wisdom of contemplating the distinctions among the three realms. Okay. Reading together is actually an art. So and when it's done effortlessly it sounds so good. We sound like a single voice. Okay, I used uh, he when I translated, but the the pronoun here is completely gender non-specific. It could be she, just fine. However you envision it, that's the bodhisattva. Because we're going to learn that this bodhisattva appears in a bunch of different bodies. So he's totally not limited to one male body or one female body, one species body, another species body, etc. So what's going on is we're hearing what the bodhisattva knows now. What is he or she capable of with this new knowledge? His, uh, remember in the last couple sections, the Bodhisattva's wisdom has, has blossomed. He, is, he or she is in a new realm now. Um, he took the right turn at the crossroads and his wisdom now is the equivalent of a sailboat being pushed by the wind compared to somebody carrying the boat through the woods on his back in terms of effort. Effortlessly now this bodhisattva knows how worlds come into being and how they go bad. He can see the creation and the end of worlds. Imagine. So, now uh, it's taking us into one world. That's tonight. What does it say? Yo, zhi, yu, jie, si, jie, wu, si, jie, cheng, yu. Zhi, yu, jie, si, jie, wu, si, jie, huai. Okay? Knows how desire, form, and formless realms come into being and pass away. What in the world would that be? Um, 
what we're seeing here is the Buddha's description of his new vision. But it's the Bodhisattva, right? This is what the Bodhisattva sees. So we get to borrow the Bodhisattva's eyes. And a large part of Mahayana Sutras is just that. It's a, a window into another realm that didn't like come into being for the sutra. It's always been there, but you haven't been able to see it until you open the sutra, because the sutra says, take a look through the bodhisattva's eyes. So it's, it's knowledge that you didn't, have, you didn't know you had before. Okay. Um, anybody get excited by geography class? I knew I did. I, I remember the first time I saw a globe. Well, let, let's get closer to home. Does everybody remember Earthrise, taken from the Mariner spacecraft? Right? If I, when I tell you the name, you don't get it. If I showed you the picture, you'd all go, yeah. It was the first time, from an astronaut's point of view, orb- orbiting the moon, that they looked out and saw the Earth as an entity. This little blue marble set against this deep black space backdrop. And it wasn't the full Earth. It was, uh, it was a partial Earth rising above the moon. Right, The astronaut had orbited behind the moon for the first time. And from that spacecraft looked up, oh, look, guess what? There's home. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's all alone. We're out there all alone. And we have water. And that's the difference. And that vision of the earth as a s- small, discrete, contained orb changed people's views. It's never not been the case. We just never saw it from that place. Once you see it from that place, suddenly it's like, that's all there is. There's only one of us that we know of. We better take care of it. We didn't know before that it's just that much. And when we lose it, if it's uninhabitable now for humans, the universe, guess what, doesn't care at all if we mess it up, if we despoil it, if we consume it, if we burn it down. The universe doesn't care. Look at all that. (laughs) You know, it's like, that's infinite. My mind can't contain how much space is out there and we've got this little thing that of all the species on the planet, we humans can ruin it. For us, not for the universe. The universe doesn't care. But we can completely foul our nest. What other creature fouls its nest? You know. So, Okay, I remember that moment, seeing that photo, and you just, you have to, you blink, and you blink, and then you get it. You comprehend what you're looking at. Okay, so that was what? Taken through the lens of someone put their human bodies outside of our orbit, outside of our Earth's gravity field, to the moon. Okay, the sutra does the same thing. This sutra takes us somewhere we haven't been before to look at us. That was the thing about Earthrise was, that's our home, right? Evening here on Earth. And we've never seen our own home that way. The Sutra shows us a view of ourselves from a Bodhisattva's eyes. No different, we're just the same, but from a new perspective, everything's different. Okay, what is it? He says, this bodhisattva, the sutra says, this bodhisattva knows the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. Okay, those are three bits of Buddha Dharma knowledge that it's helpful to have that understanding. If we can grasp what the sutra is telling us, everything's different. Again, we never quite see ourselves the same way after grasping what the sutra gives us tonight. What in the world is the desire realm? The desire realm is the 
abode of humans and our neighbors. Okay? So there are three realms. And when a Buddha wakes up, they leave, they say, they leave the three realms. They, when an arhat, arhats are not bound by these three realms. Everybody else is. So we are. What are the three realms? Desire realm is hells to the heavens, but only the first six heavens. Form realm is heavens beyond the desire realm, of which there are 28. And the formless realm is heavens beyond the form realm, of which there are four. So this is heaven and hell, you could say. That's not accurate, but that's one way to poetically refer to this. This is where we live before we become liberated from samsara. (coughs) This is birth and death in these three realms. Outside of the three realms, birth and death, and nirvana happens, but beyond. Bodhisattvas go beyond these three realms, but come right back. They choose to return. All right? Give me a second, and I'll sketch out. The most interesting one, probably, is, is the one that we live in right now, the desire realm. And the Avatamsaka Sutra, particularly a chapter called Shensho, the worthy leader chapter, talks a lot about the heavens in the desire realm. So let me sketch, tell you some of the stories found in the desire realm. The desire realm contains what? Let's go from the bottom up, hells, and then ghosts, and then animals. Okay, Those are said to be the three undesirable realms, the realms where suffering is intense. Then humans, and a funny realm called asuras, or asuras. That's one of the six paths of rebirth. Call them, if we wanted to give it a name that, that Western mythology knows, it would be Titans. Titans. Titans live in the fifth. And then the heavens, the devas, the gods. Uh, to say gods pushes a lot of buttons for non-Buddhists. So it's actually better probably to say devas. Because we don't know what devas are until we define it. And then we get, oh, okay, devas. Why is this guy cutting out? Let's see if I'm... Yeah, it's battery. I need a new battery. Okay, well, this will hold on, but it's going fast. So. Okay, so we got six paths. We've got hells. We have animals where suffering... Ghosts is next, then animals. Okay, then we've got... Mm, the three what are said to be not so terrible rebirths. Brand new battery should be good. Okay, the three rebirths, three places where we can come back that are not so terrible. What am I talking about? We currently, right this minute, those of us sitting here, are in one of those six. I'm assuming. Now, I'm looking at your form. I, I don't know if any of you might be a deva just returned, you know, to like check out the human realm. Who knows? Roberto might be secretly, you know, visiting from above. We don't know. And uh, there you go. Yeah, that, that, keep your wings inside your, your, your coat there. So, we don't. you might, people will come up for your autograph all the time. You don't have to use a pencil, you just point, you know, and your autograph ought you know. <laughs> Deva powers, whoa. Or it could be something else. Somebody could be hiding as an Ashura here, just like, you know, waiting for the opportunity to put you down because why they, lo- they live to fight, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of fluidity among within those six realms. But where it gets really interesting for our point of view, we're talking about the desire realm, the three realms. The Kamadatu, it's called. The realm of Kama, which is not, is not karma mispronounced. It's Kama meaning desire. 
like Kama Sutra, that one, where it gets really interesting is the Deva's realm, the heaven's realm. Because why? Where the desire realm meets the form realm is in the heavens. So let me stick with me here. We're going to go through the heavens of the desire realm. So the desire realm contains six heavens only. But there's heavens above that. Okay, what are they? What are the heavens of the desire realm? This is one of those six, right? Hells, ghosts, and animals where, what are they? Bodies. We're just talking about bodies. But bodies are just an expression of what's going on inside. Your body shows your thoughts and your behavior. Okay, so to, to say hells, oh, nobody wants to go to hells. What are the hells? The hells are somebody's nature expressing hellish behavior and thoughts. But it's not permanent. The nature can improve and come back as a ghost. Ooh, you know, ghosts are a body. It's almost not a body but a body that expresses ghostly thoughts and behavior. Not permanent. This is the Buddha's scheme, right? So where you're born is not permanent. It's fluid. It's kind of like a bus stop where you get off the bus. Okay, we think, oh, those people from Los Angeles, we know about them, you know. Those L.A. types, we know about them, right? They're like that. Yeah, well, uh, some of them can get, they can graduate to San Francisco, you know. We know about them. Well, then the San Franciscans graduate El Cerrito. Oh, we know about them. And then finally, they made it. Marin. Oh, heavenly realm among San Franciscans. So, oh, and then where do the Merino and Marin livers? They want to go to North Bay. Oh, they want to go to Mendocino and City of 10,000 Buddhas. You know I was going to wind up there, didn't you? So, okay, so you don't know, it's just a body currently living either in L.A. Well, of course, L.A. has to look down on somebody. Who? San Diego. Ooh. And in San Diego, they look down on Tijuana, et cetera, et cetera. So, it's just a body moving through these places expressing thoughts and behavior, right? You could say the body is the last step the thoughts are the thing that matter. Those precede the body. So it's very fluid. When we, as humans, they say, although the, the, you could say the, the gateways to the Deva's realm are multiple, you can, in theory, travel from the hells to the heavens. I guess it doesn't happen that dramatically. All, not all at once. But, the gateway to the heavens, to the Deva's realm, mostly opens from the human realm. So what do you have to do as a human to be reborn as a god? And right away, the Christians check off, right? It's like, sorry, humans don't replace gods, I'm sorry. You know, God is irreplaceable, God in heaven. He's the creator, you are creature, how could that be, right? So, this is a different story. We have a different story. And it's, it, both stories can exist simultaneously. They don't, you don't have to replace one with the other. Step back from both and listen and then, you know, send out that sonar ping into your nature and see which one bounces back as the one that you want to explore. Right. We can do that. We're, we're allowed to do that with no penalty, right? You don't lose points by exploring another story, speaking as one who has done that in my lifetime. Okay, from the, heaven, from the human realm, what do you do to change your body? The answer is blessings. Fu bao, blessings. You create, you plant is the verb we use. Plant blessings. I asked Shervo, what Shervo? How do you plant blessings? He said... Ling Taren Huan Shi. Make other people happy. And he waited for my response to that. And he said, Now, 
Mostly people only make themselves happy. That's the only concern. And he said, by, this is the funny part, by making others happy, you yourself get happy. That's the kind of the secret, no secret to happiness, is to work for others' happiness. It is an inexhaustible source of your own joy. Because the more you make others happier, the happy, the happier you become. Okay. Making others happy plants blessings. Blessings is what carries you into a different body. So, what happens? We, not in a hurry, not right away, but we die. It's not a, it's not a wish, that's a statement of fact. Our lifespan, the technical term would be that your skandhas wear out. The force that propels you into this body, tapers off, and at the appropriate time, we leave this body. Okay, And that's not the last. This is the Buddha story. right? There's another one coming. There's another one right away. The vectors that propel, think of the engines that propel us through space, mostly debts that we owe or that are owed to us, carry us, or you could say our connections, our affinities, pull us to the next rebirth. Where is it going to be, is the question. Where is your next body waiting for you? comes from two sources. One, deeds that we have done that are unfinished, debts we owe, connections we have made, or vows. Two sources. The, they call it the wind of karma, blows us to our next mom, you could say. Or, if we are, if our karma is really light and not so, if our ties are not so inescapable, we might be coming back because we choose to. Vows. Bodhisattvas come back by vows, not by karma. They come back by choice. Isn't that interesting? I mean, think about our next rebirth. Do I get to choose my mom next time? I don't know. That's interesting thought, isn't it? It just kind of, yeah, Connie. Wait, please. Microphone. If um, you now have a feeling you owe someone a debt and you don't want to wait until another lifetime to repay it because you want to just end it now, or not end it, but you know, like repay and balance out the debt now, how would you want to do that? How? How would one repay that? Okay, debt? no, okay, so Connie's question is suppose if you accept this story that you think this kind of transactional scorecard is out there that we all carry in our karmic matrix, the score, you know, how many credits, how many debits in our, on our ledger there, and you want to deal with it now instead of waiting till you die, how do you go about changing the score? Right? Mostly. That's the question? Yeah. No secret. It's just the same way you create the conditions anyway. Which is, you just be really, you be really mindful of your behavior with somebody. And where does it work? Mostly in your thoughts. So, thoughts of drop dead, you dirty rotten so-and-so, or worse, you, you know, four-letter word, any Master Hua would say, he would say things like, really pay attention to the thoughts you have towards other people because they pull you back, he would say. So, cursing somebody out, calling somebody a dirty word, dirty name, creates a negative tie. And so, if you wanted to end a relationship with somebody, a negative relationship, don't think hateful thoughts towards them. Instead, think wholesome thoughts towards them and everyone. You know, so that would be one good way. How do we tie up negative affinities with people? Thoughts, deeds, and words. One really powerful way to tie up a negative affinity with somebody is to eat their body. <laughs> Drumstick. Turkey, turkey sandwich, leftovers. Yeah, 
What do we do when we eat a turkey sandwich? We incorporate a turkey. Think of that word, incorporate. You know, in, in corp, it has corp in it, body, corpse, right? So I, yeah, how many, how many fish sandwiches have I incorporated with? How many turkey drumsticks? How many chicken wings have I incorporated with? A lot before I knew the Dharma, before I left home. How many pork roasts, you know, ham slices, ham sandwiches, etc. So that's one way. Instead, what do you do? You see an animal that is about to be slaughtered. You find a way to rescue it. Uh, liberating life is really tricky these days, uh, but that would that would have been a traditional answer. Let animals go. So, the answer, Connie, is to do wholesome deeds, and really, you don't have to like do anything special. Just stop the negativity towards a person, and bit by bit, when you see them next time, it's just like, oh, hi. It's not, you know, drop dead, you dirty rotten, you know. So, that's it. And you do it over time without telling the person. You just do good deeds. All right. So, we're going up through the heavens of the desire realm. What are they? You decided you're going to make, you're going to get to the heavens. You're going to get into the Deva's realm. You do a lot of good deeds, a lot of blessings. You're reborn your next birth, your next mom, is not on not in a human body, but in a God's body, a Deva's body. The Avatamsaka Sutra talks about what that's like. It's pretty amazing. It's how it describes the blessings that surround somebody in the heavens. There are six places in the heavens of the desire realm where we can be reborn. And I'll run through the list and each, each one is more refined. Each one is more subtle. Each one is more blessed, you could say. The first is called the heavens of the four kings. Si tian wang tian. The four deva kings are painted on the walls outside the, the doors at, at the Buddha Hall at City of 10,000 Buddhas. You can see them there. That's maybe for Americans. We don't see that many Chinese Buddhist monasteries. That's a place where you see them. If you go up to CTDB, you wonder what are those paintings outside the wall? Those are our Si Tian Wang Dian, painted right on the wall. When you go to a Chinese Buddhist monastery, you go in the front gate, and there you see these massive, huge figures, most of them looking really fierce, right? Those are, sometimes they're Vajras, but mostly they're the, the Tian Wang Dian, the, 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 the hall of the four kings. They are devas, they're gods, and they interact with humanity pretty regularly. And they, I won't give you the whole run through. You, we could fill tonight's lecture with stories about what, what goes on in the realm, the first of the heavens of the desire realm. Those devas, they're also called wheel turning kings, chakravartans, and uh, they regulate and subdue demons. That's their job. And they all have their specific demons that they subdue. Once you get into this lore, L-O-R-E, the stories of these devas, whoa, it goes on and on and on. And it gets more and more profound and more mysterious. You learn the names of the ghosts and the baddies that these devas subdue. And they're pretty fierce. We know where they live. They live halfway up Mount Sumeru the polar mountain in the center of the Buddhist description of the world. So, there we go. Next realm up, let's say you've got real blessings. Where are you born? You're born among the gods of the Triastrimsha heaven. San Shishan Tian, the gods of the heaven of the 33 devas. The leader of that realm is Chakra. Devanam Indra, also sometimes known as Indra, sometimes known as Chakra. We've heard about Indra's net, that incredible decoration that's outside his palace, which is known as Wholesome Viewpoint, Wholesome Perspectives, Good Views Palace, which is supposed to be just spectacular place to live. And Chakra 
is a deva, but he, they say, is actually a bodhisattva who appears as a deva still to take other devas across, to encourage them to not be satisfied with the blessings in the heavens, but to keep going, keep cultivating blessings and samadhi. Because why? Interestingly enough, all these realms in the desire realm, in the devas, are said to be not ultimate places. Don't stop there. Because why? When your blessings run out, you come back into the other realms. Those are just stops along the way, like the hells, the ghosts, the animals, the humans, the asuras. The devas are just another stop. It's a bus stop. And it's fleeting. right? Who says so? Norse mythology. Teutonic mythology. The, the death of the gods. right? Wagner wrote these operas. Goterdammerung, when the gods fall down. Right? The death of the gods. Greeks and the, the Norse mythology and the German mythology all talk about it. Right? So, what's really, really interesting is when you stack up Edith Hamilton's mythology from Greece and Romans with the mythology described by the Hindus and the Buddhists, they overlap. In interesting ways. Not exactly, but a lot of similarities, interestingly. So maybe these stories about the gods are not, quote, mythological meaning made up. Maybe this is observation. Maybe this is the way it is. Some of our oldest books in humanity's knowledge say that. Buddhist sutras. They have the Vedas, Hindu texts, and the sagas of the Norwegians, the Swedes, the Finns, the Danes, right? <clears throat> so, Norse mythology overlaps a lot. All right. To talk about what goes on in the heaven of the 33, check the Avatamsaka Sutra. It describes warfare. You could go to war as a god. Imagine going to the heavens and being drafted as a soldier. You can, you do, it happens. It's amazing. And what else? In the Deva's realm, desire is still a big part of life. So, boy and girl gods get married. Right? Baby gods emerge. You can have kids in the, in the, in the heavens. Right? And they get old and die. And there's warfare there. Who comes up? The Asuras. This, these stories go on. Man. These stories, somebody really ought to write wonderful novels about Buddhist life in the, in, the hell, in the heavens because the stories are amazing, right? So, the Asuras contend for power with the Devas and go to war. And the Avatamsaka Sutra describes how Chakra uses his shantong, his psychic powers, to appear in front of the, the Asura soldiers and scare them to death. So they retreat and they Let's come back to fight again another day. He appears as a fierce Vajra with eyes shooting thunderbolts and his teeth going out and tusks like that. And he's got manifests a thousand hands, each one holding a Vajra pestle, each one of those heads coming directly to this single Ashura soldier who goes, Oh my God. Omitofo. And he retreats. Okay. Next level of the heavens is what? The Suyama heaven. And the Suyama heaven translates as the heaven where time is divided very finely. Here we go beyond the sun and the moon. The bodies of the devas emit light. So what a blessed rebirth, right? Sun and the moon stop at the heaven of the 33. At this point we're above the polar mountain. The, the Triastremsha heaven is the top of Mount Sumeru. The four heavenly devas, the four, king, the four god kings, the four kings of heaven, they're halfway up Mount Sumeru. The Triastremsha heaven is on the peak. And then we're off the mountain into space. And the gods of the Suyama heaven live beyond the sun and moon. Furthermore, their bodies are more refined and their lifespans are longer 
than the gods of the Tristremsha, whose bodies are more beautiful and experience more bliss than the gods of the four heaven, the kings, the four kings, heavens. So we're in heaven number three out of six now. And these gods have incredibly blissful lives, long lived. And there's, there's all these levels of story for each heaven. For example, I mentioned that desire is still there. So what about the attraction between men and women? It's described as increasingly more subtle. And I won't, I won't go into it in detail, but Master Hua occasionally would, would go to these stories and he would say, I, f- I forget which one it is, it might be the Suyama heaven where men and women cohabit through a glance, just not even a touch, just by looking. They, they you know, procreate. So now we're in heaven number four. Heaven number four is an amazing heaven in the desire realm, right? It's called the Tushita heaven. The Tushita heaven. And the Tushita heaven has an inner court and an outer court. And the inner, the outer court is the upper limit of the disasters that end the eon another whole body of knowledge about the heavens, which is what? In the Buddhist description of cosmology, how the world works, there is a time when the worlds are destroyed. Our sutra talks about how the Bodhisattva sees how yu jie huai, right? Yu jie cheng, yu jie huai, how the desire realm is destroyed. When a world system is destroyed, there's a disaster of fire, a disaster of water, and there's a disaster of wind. Furthermore, there's a disaster of plague, disease. These things happen, and the world is done, and it comes around again. And there's about to be a world born, and it goes through the cycle again. Those disasters go up to the outer court of the Tushita heaven. If you are reborn in the desire realm, fourth heaven called the Tushita, make sure you're in the inner palace, not the outer courtyard. Who lives in the inner courtyard of the Tushita heaven? Anybody know? Maitreya, the next Buddha. Maitreya, the Buddha, Tang Lai Xia Sheng Mi Lei Zun Fu, right? The Buddha, Maitreya, who is about to be reborn, or any world's Buddha. Ours happens to be Maitreya, because we, our Buddha was Shakyamuni. And when the time comes, Maitreya will come down, and the dragon flower Dharma assembly will, be, will happen, and we'll have a new Buddha for three days and three nights. So make your reservations now. Get your tickets. Don't wait. You might, might be sold out. You know, But I have points. Can I trade in my miles? for? So Maitreya is in a secure place. The disasters at the end of the eon won't touch the inner court of the Tushita heaven. We hear like all these, you know, if, if I, I could tell you stories about each heaven, one per night, and we'd still have more stories. For example... Master Xuanzang, Xuanzang Da Shi, right? Xuanzang, Tripitaka, Sanzang Fa Shi, right? We know him. He had a great affinity with Maitreya, Bodhisattva. He really, really devoted his attention to Maitreya, translated his shastras and his, his talks. He wanted to see him. And on his way to India to bring the sutras back, he was waylaid by bandits. Not good. He was on a boat on the Ganges River and it came around the corner and here were all these pirates on pirate boats waiting to trap unwary, unwary travelers. And these pirates worshipped the Durga. Check out your mythology about the Durga. The Durga is a, a feminine deity who is female deity who is fierce and demands human sacrifice every year. 
So they waited for a good-looking man to sacrifice to the Durga. Who was it? Oh, we'll take you. You look really good, monk. <laughs> you know. And he was. Everybody described him as very handsome, tall, and you know, very strong and strong tree. You know. And so all the other passengers said, "No, no, 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 not him, not him. Bad juju. You kill him. We'll take one of us. No, no, we like him. He's the best-looking one." So, no, no, don't kill the monk. You're, you don't know what's going to go. Oh, bad idea, bad idea. Oh, no. Omitofo, omito. Every story ends with omitofo, omito. Right. <laughs> so, they say, nope. And so, Master Shrenjong says, oh, you want me? Sure, no problem. Okay, but, he said, give me some time. Let me make peace with my God. No, all right. Don't be long, you know. This is India. They understand that kind of stuff. So, so they built a mound and they did their rituals for the Durga and prepared and Master Shrendrang sat in full lotus on, on the place where they put him and entered Samadhi and the story goes, this is his biography, which is the Chinese are great historians, that's one thing for sure. What did he do? His spirit, they say, ascended to the inner palace, courtyard of the Tushita heaven and he saw Maitreya Bodhisattva in person, listened to him speak the Dharma, and was happy. And said, I want to stay. <laughs> Maitreya Bodhisattva said, not yet. No, you're not done. You've got to go back. And so the, the bandits, the pirates, were going, come on, it's time. You know, our, our sundial tells us it's time to go. And so he came back and he was so radiant he glowed, having just been audienced with Maitreya, and this wind blew up from all ten directions. The wind blew, and it blew all the sand, picked all the sand up off the sandbank where they were, the Ganges River, fine river sand, and blew the trees apart and blew the weapons of the bandits into the river, and all the bandits are make it stop, make it stop, we won't kill you, and they bowed to him, and he said, oh, I'm, I'm ready, he said, you want to sacrifice me? No, 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 we don't want to touch you. No, no, please make it stop. Right? So he made the wind stop, and they all took refuge and became Buddhists on the spot, you know, and promised never to kill any travelers again. And they said, you know, because why? Because he glowed, and he made the tornado come and, you know, threatened to blow them away. So what do you do with a story like that? That's like, Oh, that's those Buddhists. They're so cute, you know. <laughs> Their stories. But the Indian government used that very same book as their geography text. Because why? He was the reliable source who traveled places. Nobody had traveled or kept, took notes. He, Master Shrenjong's observations was the official Indian geography for places that other people didn't go. So how trustworthy is that? You, maybe you pick and choose this, which stories you believe. But in this story, he went to the inner court of the Tushita Palace and saw Maitreya. Okay. How credible are you? Ah, interesting, huh? So there's human-deva interaction from the Tang Dynasty. Okay, cool. So, what next? Keep going. Don't stop there. We've got two more heavens to go. And there's a heaven called the Hua Le Tian, the bliss, the joy that comes from transformation. Now, your blessings have to be pretty thick to get beyond the Tushita heaven, <coughs> but you're still in the desire heaven. Bodies are bigger, lifespans are longer. Every heaven is that way as you proceed up, right? So here's the devas in this place and their bodies are so refined that the joy they experience, pretty subtle. It's not like us who have, you know, chocolate. Chocolate does a lot of us in, you know. Like you see chocolate and your knees get weak, you know. You can't not eat it if you see chocolate. Or... What is what? What do you like? Some people. What is your comfort food? Is it pao mian, right? Oh yeah, just get some pao mian. Wow, let's get the tzuji kind of pao mian. That's the best kind. 
What kind? White tofu? Fried tofu, okay. Now we know. For me, I w- pumpkin pie was one of mine for a long time. But that, that's over. But, you know, so every, we have food that we just like put that on our tongue and we just, it just brings all these associations, right? Compared to the devas, those kind of sensory pleasures they see as very fleeting, thin. Their senses are refined. Now, you don't have to taste those, you know. I know folks who truly uh, require sizzling meat. The juices of barbecue are what, you know, if they don't have it, they... I mean, at one point I was that way. Um, So, a deva has been working on his or her blessings and making others happy and at the same time have been purifying their six senses through what? The ten wholesome deeds. Shifu would say, if you really want to get to the heavens, yao feng xing, yao shou chi wu jie feng xing, feng xing shi shan. Hold the five precepts, enact the ten wholesome deeds. Okay? So, let's just look at this. What? We, there's lots of ways to talk about the precepts and the ten good deeds, but just think about it in terms of untying your body from the world. Okay? Let's look at that. that that's, that's our standard now. Not, Connie asked the question, how do you end relationship or connection before you die? How do you do it? Okay, if the answer is, I'm going to untie my body from things that would hold me back. Think of it this way. Five precepts. I'm not going to kill anybody. I'm not going to steal from anybody. I'm not going to lust my way into cheating on anybody or being promiscuous just for selfish desire. I'm not going to lie to anybody. And I'm not going to drug myself. Intoxicate myself. So... I, don't, I haven't forced anybody's life out of their body. I haven't deprived anybody of what they need to sustain their livelihood. I haven't disturbed their nature with lustful attraction that attaches people through emotion. That's the third precept. And I haven't used my words to deceive them. Then I don't drug myself. So, Pretty loosely tied to the world. Okay, five precepts. Ten good deeds. How about those? Or the ten evil deeds. The Avatamsaka, the second ground where we ran into these, right? They're familiar. Three with the body. Killing, stealing, and lust. We just did those three with the precepts. There are four with the mouth. Four ways to tie yourself into the world through false speech that deceives people. What are they? Lying. Right? Duplicity, backbiting, double tongue speech is called, like a fork tongue. What else? Profanity, harsh speech. And then frivolous speech, which either deludes or defiles through dirty jokes, for example. Okay? Four with the mouth. And then three with the mind, which is greed, anger, and usually they say false views. Wrong views for the tenth one. So, ten things. I don't do. I don't tie myself into the world with my body, my mouth, and my mind. Live that way, and you live lightly on the world. You're, you don't have a whole bunch of trails behind you. right? You've pulled your six senses in and pulled them back. So it's very clean, very light. So these devas, in, remember, we're in number five now. Devas whose their joy comes from transformation. Hua le tian, it's called. So they, they're able to transform desire. Their presence in a body is very transparent. You could say very light. Very pure beings. Blissful up there. Nice being a god. Pretty nice. And you enjoy life for a long time. Okay. Got to keep moving. Number six. Boy, this one is something else. It's called the Ta 
Hua Zi Zai Tian, the Vashavarta Nimitta. What is it, Jin Chuan? You have your, your research, you have your notes there. Vashavarta Nimitta, the Tahua Zi Zai Tian. Vashavarta, how, how does it go? I, I never quite get it right. We're going to hear the right Sanskrit here, putting them on the spot. Yeah, you'll find it. Let me know when you find it. Okay, so in that Deva realm, the same thing is happening, which is bodies get bigger, physically larger, and lifespan extends, and the blessings there are incredible. You're just about to leave the desire realm. You're, you live in a realm that is at a gate. Now, desire is kama. Here's, this is fascinating stuff. The deva king, I'm sorry, said it wrong. The demon king, the boss of the demons. And demons are known mara. Have you got it? Yeah, I have it. What is it? Paranirmita vashavartan. Paranimitta vashavartan. Yeah. Heaven. There you go. <laughs> Tahua zizaitian. There you go. Paranimitta Vashavardhan Tev. What is Hua Le Tian? Oh, okay. Before that. Um, okay. In the Buddhist cosmology, Satan is a real being, right? He's called Mara in Sanskrit, which means the destroyer, the killer. And Mara is a real being. But look at this. He lives in the sixth desire heaven. The Deva king lives in the heavens. Now, where else in available mythology is that the case? Anybody read the Hebrew scriptures? Anybody read the book of Job in, in Hebrew? In the book of Job, there's a conversation between Satan and God, the Father, Satan lives in the heavens. And what is it? The Nirmanarati. Nirmanarati. Nirmanarati heaven, right? Yeah. Nir yeah. Okay, Nirmanarati. There we go. Nirmanarati. That's number five. Long story short, Satan and God make a bet about one of God's most faithful disciples, a man named Job. And... Satan says, he will turn his back on you. He will renounce you. Guaranteed. God says, no, he won't. So they make a bet. And then he tests him. He gives him these trials. So Satan falls out of the heavens. Now what's funny about that? When you think of the demon king, you don't look up. Right? Where are demons supposed to be found? In the hills. Yeah. Right. Right. But... Here's the Buddhist cosmology and the Hebrew scriptures agreeing that Satan is a god. But he's evil. He's a destroyer. What does he want to do? He wants dominion, is the, the, the biblical word. He wants to be the boss of everybody under him in the desire realm. What does he not want to have happen? He doesn't want to lose you beyond his control. He doesn't want you to leave the desire realm because then he can't control you. Are there realms beyond Satan's realm? Oh, this is only the top of the first one. We've got the form realm and the formless realm to go. Much more do we have the world beyond samsara, the world of nirvana, where Buddhas and bodhisattvas live. Okay, what does Mara do? Mara deludes, entices, seduces, tricks, whatever it takes to keep you in desire. What is the thing that he uses to hook you? Your senses, our senses, and your mind, particularly. But, Buddha, underneath the tree, Sitting there, the prince, not the Buddha yet, still a prince, says, I know it's my mind. I've got to sit here till I understand my mind. Forty-nine days pass. And the Buddha goes, 
um, the Mara, the demon king, looking down from the heavens, goes, he could get out. i got to stop him. Sends his daughters to try to seduce him. Doesn't work. The Buddha goes, no, thanks, but you guys really need to take care of yourselves. You're going to get old and die too, like me. So I'm just sitting here until I can leave, and, and you're welcome to sit with me too, but uh, you, have you seen? You're, you're older now than when you started dancing, you know? <laughs> And uh, how come you guys didn't laugh at that? So, so, how many pairs of shoes do you need, girls? He says, you know, and they go, ah, my feet are getting old. And so what they go, that's true. Why am I trying to seduce him? I'm going to die. Maybe I better look into it myself. They go, and Mara goes, curses, right? My daughter has betrayed me. They woke up, you know. Oh, they're going to go enroll in a mindfulness course. And so, what will we do now? Oh, come the soldiers. Rum, tum, tum. Come the armies. And the prince couldn't be moved by that kind of desire. Mara says, maybe I'll scare him. And so, all these troops come. He transforms and they shoot their arrows, their flaming arrows. And the Buddha goes, oh, you guys, waste of time. No, I've, I've seen my own mind. That's the scariest thing I know. And your arrows... No way. No, we're all going to die. You know, you better pay attention to that. And the arrows turn into lotus flowers. Mara goes, curses! You know, he couldn't entice him. He couldn't scare him. Couldn't hook him by desire. Couldn't move him by fear. What can Mara do? And Mara comes along and says, you know, who says you're enlightened? Buddha says, the earth says. Touches it. The earth shakes. Mara vanishes. At that point, the prince went out of the desire realm. But that's the deal. To get to the next level of the devas, to the heavens, we have to pass through that sixth heaven where Mara wants us to stay. So, translate that into your meditation. How difficult is it to sit still through pain, through illusion of the mind, right? And what waits at that gate between the sixth heaven and the form realm? Samadhi, particularly the dhyanas. What happens next? We're going to go now across that barrier, that fence, through that fence, to the form realm, Su Jie, also known as the Brahma heaven. The Brahma heaven. And in this next level, we're leaving that first realm. He knows the desire realm, how the form realm, how the formless realm are created. Right? We're leaving that realm and going to the form realm. And what we meet, 28 heavens squeezed into four dhyanas and beyond. So if you can meditate to the point where you turn your six senses and harmonize them into the chu chan ding, the dhyana, the, f- the first dhyana, Mara goes, curses. You're beyond Mara. You're in the form realm. So meditate to the dhyanas, first, second, third, and fourth, and you are what do you meet in those realms? You meet the god called Ishvara, which is Tzidzai Tian. You go for, further, you meet the god known as Maheshvara, Ta Tzidzai Tian. And you go through the dhyanas. Now, as I say, the, the stories go on forever. Who is waiting for you in the, in the form realm are Arhats waiting through their seven rebirths, one rebirth, no further rebirth, and full arhatship. They're called the heavens of no return. The five heavens of no further return. That's where arhats go, waiting for their, you know about the first fruit, second, third, and fourth fruition arhats? They have seven rebirths, one rebirth, no further rebirths, and full arhatship. They're in the heavens, waiting. Like 
Maitreya is in the form in the desire realm heaven called the Tushita. Arhats, as they go through their final, final rebirths, are in the form realm. Now, the Avatamsaka Sutra talks about the gods in the form realm. My gosh, they are incredible. The the thing they have the seven the the seven rewards of a sage. They have the wheel, jewel, the seven treasures of the, the, the Brahma heaven. They've got the, the arm, the, uh, what is it, the, the horse jewel, the wheel jewel, the uh, army, the soldier's jewel, the, uh, what a, this, I don't know what, the, I can't do all seven off the top of my head, but that's some of the blessings of the form heaven. They travel in a palace, kind of like a motorhome with wings, I guess. Can you imagine a, a, a Deva's Airstream, an Airstream for the heavens, Airstream trailer, an SUV for the, an, an RV for the heavens. So, that's what it's like there. And, yeah, Locke. We have a question online here. Okay. Are all beings in the sixth heaven Mara, or there are other kinds of beings too? B, choice B. It's a real heaven. There are devas. It's, it's like the other heavens. There are residents who are in the body of a god in the sixth heaven. But that's where Mara rules. So like we have a president. Let's not talk about him. Let's talk about the governor. We have a governor. <laughs> Governors in Sacramento. We know about him. We don't see him every day. Mara's in the sixth heaven. We know about him. We don't see him every day. But there are other residents in Sacramento. <coughs> okay. So, there it is. And the, um, each of the heavens of the 28 levels of heaven in the form realm have their stories. They have their, you know, lore. They, and uh, when Sherful would go into it, he would say, oh my goodness, in these heavens, if you're hungry, of course, if you're in the dhyanas, Chan Yue Wei Shi, take the, may they take Diana bliss for food and be filled with the joy of the Dharma. We do it at lunch every day, right? So if you're in the form realm, the Brahma heavens, you don't eat a lot, but it, the food is, you think of it and it comes just the way you like it. Hot, cold, sweet, sour, anything you like. Clothing, exactly as you like it. Wow, you have... Better than an Hermes handbag. Just boom, you have it, right? You want Lan Van, you want, you know, what do you want? Louis Vuitton, you just, there it is. LV bags, left and right. Wow, name brands, head to toe, Ming Pai. Oh, no. Can you imagine? How nice. Just think about it. Poof, there it is. You know. So, but guess what? you can fall from there, those realms, if you don't continue to cultivate. That's one of the, you know, in Islam, what's the goal of Islam is, is uh, what, how do they describe it? It's paradise, right? That's, that's the word they use. It's a heavenly realm. You're there with, you know, the descriptions in the Holy Quran about heaven. What does Judaism seek? It seeks rebirth with God you know what is my mom bless her heart in her Methodism she wanted to be at God's right hand you know Buddhism says that's all good it's not permanent it's not the end you can leave those realms just the way you can lose your human body and switch to another one depending on what you do so in Buddhism in Mahayana in particular they always say keep going not ultimate. Doesn't say don't go there, but if you vow for the pure land, you go to a realm that is permanent. Follow Amitabha's vows and reach a realm that doesn't stop you in the heavens, doesn't lodge you in the heavens. The heavens, the realm of the gods, is like a hotel, a really nice one, a multi-star hotel, right? But uh, it's not, not ultimate. So now, with that in mind, okay, 28 realms. You leave the form realm, you go to the formless realm. The formless realm gods 
they're so refined and so pure, their bodies are no longer tied to their senses. They're only consciousness. That's hard to imagine. But there's, they, their lifespans are very, very, very long. But they also have to continue because you can get to the heavens and, you know, stuck. Because life, a long lifespan. So it's not a desirable destination. Um, when you get to the top of that third realm, the formless realm, the next stop is the first stage of our hot ship. Followed by second, third, and fourth stage of our hot ship. And interestingly, if you get to that through what? Through your meditation, through your Vajra wisdom that sees through ignorance, your nature is now revealed. How pure do your senses have to be? You know, I can be sitting right where Jin Chuan Shir is sitting, as I was for years and years and years and years and years, as the only monk present here, and sitting and thinking, wow, this must be a whole lot like the Dhyanas. And then a smell would come down the hallway from the kitchen. <laughs> Pizza today? Oh, back into my body, you know, right away. Oh, no, I hope it's not, oh, who's, who's making pho today? You know? and I, boom, back into my body, right out of the Dhyanas, you know. All it takes is one of the six senses to twitch and you're back in your body. Because the dhyanas, back in the form realm, right, have, are very pure. And could it be that Mara is sitting right beside me with a fan wafting that smell? Let's see if we can get in to move. Ah, oh, you're back in the desire realm. Oh, yeah. Or things you hate, right? If you hate something, you're back because you moved your senses kicked off. Suddenly there's a nose and a smell and a consciousness. Suddenly there's an ear and a sound and a consciousness. And you're back in your body. That's how hard it is. But if you can get that all working through deep wisdom and a sense of what, you don't hate the world, you're just not stuck to it. You can take it or leave it. It's like, "Uh uh-huh, been there, done that. How many times? I'm going somewhere else this time. Right? Okay? Hold on. So, um, I heard that in the tantric tradition, when people like tra- try to transfer, can't can't hear. Transfer, you got to make bring your voice out to everybody's ears, uh, please. People just like a person just pass away, they would prefer the human realm over the heaven. So, I guess my question is like. Uh, what's the relationship between this whole hierarchical thing with Buddhahood? Do you like is your it your voice is vanishing? Sorry, you got to. Ah, I okay. it has to come all the way to my ears before I can know your question. Yeah. There you is go. Is it better yeah. now? Yeah. Okay, so I heard that in the tantric tradition, when when people try to transfer a person who just passed away, um, they would prefer the human realm over the heaven. Um, somehow, I don't know. And so uh, my question is, like, what's the relationship between Buddhahood and the hierarchy? Is it on top of the whole thing? Or like, does going to heaven make you closer to liberation? Or like, why is the human realm special? Okay. The, that's not only, you say, the tantric description. That's it, the Mahayana does, has the same explanation. Her question was, she's heard that human rebirth is preferable to the devas. Why? And the reason being, humanity has suffering. If you're in a human body, it's not all blissful. And pain is a is an engine to cultivate. Pain makes you want to wake up. But it's also blissful. Humanity is not. Being a human, living a human body, is not all misery. It's not all suffering all the time. But it's an opportunity to wake up to the nature of both pain and pleasure. In the heavens, in the deva's realm, 
that's harder because it's really pleasant right if here's an example how many of you have flown business class when's the last time you flew business class somebody okay nobody nobody wants to admit it right okay I uh, yeah so um, because I focused on one airline I got a lot of points on one airline and because I'm on, I spend hours on airplanes going to down under, you know. So I showed up, San Francisco, and the, uh, the nice lady at the counter said, you know, you're going to have to, th- these miles expire, why don't you upgrade? So we'll upgrade you to business class. So it's like, okay, sure. So in business class, right, you're going to extend your seat into a bed. You can lie down and sleep flat. You know, in business class. And nobody's around you. Your seat is a little c- carol, right? And this, this, the uh, flight attendant comes along. As soon as you hit your seat, she says, may I offer you something to drink, sir? You know? And it's like, yeah, sure, why not? Okay, orange juice, that's nice. You know? And then you have a sound-canceling headphone, and you've got a big TV and a list of all these movies, and the food is actually edible and good, you know? And all these amenities and a bag with nice stuff. They, and it's like, and just 30 feet back, people are crouched in, oh my God, you know, here I go again, you know. Let's see. And, I, and worse, in the middle, you know, oh, and 30 feet this way and somebody's lying back with, you know, an extra drink and nuts before lunch, salt, you know. And, and it's like, same plane, very different experience for your body for your senses what's the difference 30 feet you know this side of the curtain or that side of the curtain no other difference devas are living their lives but it's a different experience and you get off the plane having been in business class and you you look back you know and hmm, cattle you know you know (laughs) sheep and you're the shepherd, you know. It's like, oh, and then in front of you is what first class. And there's fewer and fewer first class seats these days because I looked. I was buying a ticket for Australia this time, and business class is double economy, and first class is double business class. So if if one ticket is fifteen hundred dollars, business is three thousand, first class is six thousand. Same plane, all the seats arrive at the same time, <laughs> as they say, you know. So devas experience pleasure in a body just like we are, but it's different. Okay, go down. What's it like to be born in the hells? Which are also, we've been talking about the heavens. This whole lecture has been about, you know, the desire form and formless realm. There are three destinies that are also alive in a body, but, oh my goodness, the experience is different. They die and come back and die and come back and die in horrible ways. Okay. I, you know, if you, um, I grew up in Toledo. 60 miles north is Detroit. And when I grew up, it was the heyday of General Motors and Ford and Chrysler. Detroit was Motown. Motor City. Motown is no town for me. We, being in, from Ohio, we could poke fun at Detroit because that was another state. That was Michigan. And we always beat them in football. And by the way, who won today? The rivalry. Michigan and Ohio State. The only rivalry. Who won? Anybody know? Anybody keep track of my, my dad would, would know. My dad was an ardent Ohio State fan. So in Detroit, in the heyday of the automotive industry, the suburbs in Detroit were some of, I think Gross Point Shores was the number one, outside of White Plains, maybe New York, was the most wealthy suburb in America. Right? Now... There are entire square miles of Detroit where no 
internet provider provides service because they don't dare take their trucks in to lay the cable. It will be stolen overnight. No satellite dish. You do you dare. It will be stolen, even if it's on the second floor of the building. There are no services to neighborhoods in Detroit. No water, no electricity, no police, no fire. It burns, you burn with it. Why? It's bombed out. There's no people there. But there are people. There's Detroit is reinventing itself. Neighbors coming together. I was reading the other day about neighbors trying to create their own internet service for each other with their own tech, you know. Detroit is, it's hard to imagine a city that has been chewed up and spit out. And yet, like Detroit, there are neighborhoods in Cleveland and in Youngstown and in Canton and in Akron and other towns. It's just Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin. These inner cities that are no longer habitable. Services don't go there. Right? And that's an American city that used to be the pride of the Midwest. It's now known as collectively the Rust Belt. Right? So, okay, what happened? Well, it's kind of like the hells, but not. It's not. It's human habitation. But, my goodness, when you drive through those neighborhoods, and you see these houses that all the pipes have been stolen out and resold for the copper. All of the, the concrete cast stairs going up from the street to the house have been stolen and resold. So here's a box of a building. No glass left, no pipes left, no cement left. It's just a box. Nobody wants to bulldoze it. It's too much effort to bulldoze it. It's just there. And you can't live in it because... It's been taken over and where it's bulldozed is returned to basically a pasture. Inside of Detroit, there are square miles that have become, nature has taken them back. And you go, my goodness, look at that. How impermanent is conditioned existence? Right? So, yeah, Living in the hells, you have your body, but your connections are there to destroy you repeatedly. And it, because of the karma, a wind blows you back to life. Luck. We have someone from Ann Arbor. Um, so Ohio State one. No, oh, Ohio State one. Yeah. Again. Well, we knew we would. Thank you for but, that. Um, but the question from another person is that um, is the Reverend referring to those gods as though they actually exist and not just a manifestation of the mind? Referring to those? Like the um, heavenly um, okay. beings. All right. Good question. Thank you for that question. And we have, according to my clock, three minutes with which to answer. Um, so. I would challenge the questioner and say, does the pure land actually exist or is it only a state of mind? And the answer is, I don't know yet. Or I knew but I forgot. You can't really prove it, so it becomes the province of debate. And you can convince me with your argument, but I don't really believe that you will ever know the answer until you come back. If you listen to the sages and the worthy monks, like our teacher, he would say both. From the Chan school's point of view, what does the Chan school say? They say, your nature is the pure land, your mind is Amitabha. If you can recite the Buddha's name until you experience the Nian Fo San Mei, 
the Buddha recitation Samadhi, for you, you're in the Pure Land. You're still alive in this body. You can experience it. And that's what they say. Right? You recite one day, two days, three, four, seven days with one mind unconfused. At the end of life, this person will appear before Amitabha. The Chan school says, if you can do it now through Chan, you're in the Pure Land. Okay, so that's one of the reasons that Chan and Pure Land merged. How hard is that to do? It's hard to do. To have your mind that pure. Because why? One smell of pho or pizza and I'm, you know, one look at chocolate and I'm back into my body. My samadhi is broken. So the path is the same. Now, most people can't do it. So what do we do? We follow the vows and go to the pure land, which is in the West, many millions of miles away. For me to say, oh, that's not really true, it's only a Chan Samadhi, that's not true. There are stories after stories after stories filling books of people who recite the Buddha's name and at the end of life, their eyes open up and they go, here comes Amitabha to greet me. I'm going to the West. There's a thick book called Xifang Sheng Xian Lu, right? Stories of the sages who go off to the Pure Land. It happened in, in my presence, right? So don't say, I've got a, a song coming up right now that, that answers that question. So my quick answer to the question would be both. Am I saying that the pure land is only a metaphor for the mind, purified mind? Nope. That would be shortchanging Amitabha's vows. Is the Pure Land really a place out there and you have to die to find out? No, that's not true either. Depends on how you get there. But there's a big Buddha image lit up right over our head that is a Western manifestation of that story. It's a really good story. I like that story. Because it says, you know, Amitabha's waiting for you. Use his vows and you can go. You need faith, vows, and practice. Xin, yuan, xin. And you get there. I like that story. You know. So I'm going to, you know, focus on reciting the Buddha's name. Try it out. So, to say that I'm going to enter the Buddha recitation samadhi, um, that takes a lot of practice, a lot of time. But it really, it'll get you there too. Okay. Uh, what have we got? We we're, didn't make much progress in our sutra, but um, I don't get a chance to, to tell those deva stories very often. And when we see the three realms, everybody should remember desire, form, and formless. And understand that those are operating full time right now. The, the three realms are us. We do the three realms. Bhikshuni hung in. Don't say the Western land is somebody else's dream. Here in the suffering Saha world, things are not what they seem. Is it in there? Is it in there? Which page? Oh, it's not. It's not in this one. Sorry, I wish it were. This is in the other songbook. Yeah, so. Okay. So, here in the suffering Saha world, things are not what they seem. And if you can learn to return the light and recite the Buddha's name a lot, then the seven pools with their seven jewels will appear in the space of a thought. So, is that real or is it a state of mind? Mm. Recite and find out. Don't ask me. Why do you ask me? Amitabha Buddha, in a former life, was a bhikshu named Fazam. He made 48 vows, and every vow was to take living beings along to the western land where the living's grand, where people know no pain. And don't you know that you can go if you 
keep reciting his name. Of the colors of the mountains, none are not his vast long tongue. The sparkling streams, the forest green, his compassionate song is sung. The water flows, the wind blows, whispering his name. When he takes you by the hand to his happy land, you'll be so glad you came. Good song. Don't say the western land is somebody else's dream. Here in the suffering Saha world, things are not what they seem. And if you can learn to return the light and recite the Buddha's name a lot, seven pools with their seven jewels will appear in the space of a thought. Amitabha Buddha in a former life was a big shoe named Fadzam. He made 48 bows. Every bow was to take living beings along. Saha land where the living, I'm sorry, wrong, to the western land where the living's grand and people know no pain. Don't you know that you can go if you'll just keep reciting his name? Of the colors of the mountains, none are not his vast long tongue. In the sparkling streams, the forest green, his compassionate song is sung. The water flows, the river, the wind blows, whispering his name. When he takes you by the hand to the happy land, you'll be so glad you came. Don't say the western land is somebody else's dream. Here in the suffering Saha world, things are not what they seem. And if you can learn to recite his name, you can learn to return the light and recite his Buddha's name a lot. Then the seven pools with their seven jewels will appear in the space of a thought. Ballad of Amitabha. Isn't that good? Yeah, that's a good song. Now, there's one more. This is the one that I told you we probably can't sing because it's around. And uh, it's got three parts like good rounds do. It's a waltz. Amitabha, born in the western land. Amitabha, can you all do that? Amitabha, Amitabha, born in the western land. That's not too hard, is it? That's about six words. Yeah, there we go. Amitabha, 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 born in the western land. Here we go. Born in the lotus pool. With karma clear and cool, blessings and wisdom full, from Bodhi will be irreversible. Amitabha. Here we go, join me. Amitabha. Amitabha. Born in the Western land. Take us by the hand, lead us to your land. There's no suffering. Amitabha saves everyone who sings. Amitabha. There you go, your part. 
By day and night the same When your life is through Amitabha comes to deliver you Amitabha 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 Born in the western Okay, what's the third part? We got we got the chorus, we got the verses. The third part is Namo Amitabha, 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 Namo Amitabha,
If Taiwan is heaven, then they use line for sure. So. Okay, uh, any more announcements that we have? Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. All right, so dedication of merit then. Um, the last page of your songbook or flip over your Dharma request. What are you, what would you like to transfer to? What kind of rebirth? Transfer to rebirth in the heavens. As long as you get there and cultivate, why not? Right? Move on through the heavens, out of the desire realm, into the form realm, and beyond the form realm to the formless realm, and then on up into the levels of our hot ship. And then you make the Bodhi resolve and come back as a Bodhisattva. I would get scolded for messing up Shurfu's verse. Ah, boy, I can hear it now. Oh. Okay, uh, follow the path. If it's the Tao, advance. If it's not the Tao, retreat from it. Pick what's good and follow, and pick what's bad and change it in yourself. That's how it goes. See you all next week. Or tomorrow. Respect to the Venerable Master.
Dhammu Dhafangwa